Marseille is France's second city. Population, 870,000, making almost twice the size of France's third largest city of Lyon. Marseille has a very different feel about the place to Paris though. For a start, it's poor. And not poor on the fringes like Paris, with rings of increasingly more impoverished communities the further you travel from the centre of the French capital. No, Marseille is poor to its very core, particularly in the city's northern districts. Much like most of Britain's cities, Marseille's housing estates lie within the heart of the city itself, where job prospects are poor, and many opt for a life of crime instead. Marseille is also the historic gateway to France from the Mediterranean, making it one of Europe's most diverse cities, both ethnically and culturally. There are communities from North Africa, from former and current French colonies, from China, Vietnam, and all over Europe. Marseille has the highest Muslim population of any city in France, at roughly 25%, but the city also has the third largest Jewish community of any city in Europe, trailing only London and Paris. Marseille is an old city, among the oldest in Europe, and so old in fact, that a number of the city's most historic buildings are now literally crumbling to pieces, having been allowed to fall into a state of disrepair over many years, presenting a very real health and housing crisis. Yes, Marseille is a city with multiple personalities. One of lavish wealth, lying in one of France's wealthiest regions, but also of extreme destitution, home to some of France's most impoverished communes. It is a city of violence and organised crime, struggling to shake off its reputation as France's murder capital, but also one of stunning architecture, culture and beauty. Marseille is home to communists and National Front supporters, or National Rally, as they are now known. But despite all of these ethnic, financial, social, cultural and indeed political divides, there is one thing that has long united the citizens of Marseille, and that is their football club. Though single club cities aren't uncommon in France, Marseille is an enormous city to only have one major football club, and OM also enjoy widespread support throughout France, and particularly across the country's southern regions. The end result is, by a number of metrics, France's most popular club but at the very least, one of the nation's big three, alongside Lyon, and of course their great rivals, Paris Saint-Germain. The Stade Velodrome is the largest stadium in Ligue 1, and it is both a sight and a sound to behold when it's packed to the rafters. And Marseille fans have been given plenty to cheer about over the years at the old ground. OM were France's most successful club prior to the injection of Qatari cash into PSG, and they remain the nation's second most successful club now. Marseille are nine-time French champions, and they are the only French team to have won either the European Cup or its successor, the Champions League, which they won in 1993 when they beat the AC Milan team of Paolo Maldini, Franco Baresi, Frank Rijkaard, and Marco van Basten, expertly marshalled by Fabio Capello 1-0 at the Olympia Stadion in Munich. However, if there was just one or two words synonymous with Marseille, it wouldn't be trophies and success, but scandal and chaos. At a club where controversy has never been too far around the corner, in true Marseille fashion, even the circumstances surrounding OM's 1993 European conquest is mired in doubt due to a match-fixing scandal which saw the club stripped of the 1992-93 Ligue 1 title and punished with an enforced relegation from France's top flight. OM were found guilty of having attempted to bribe a Ligue 1 opponents in the build-up to their Champions League final, hoping to rest players in anticipation of their trip to Munich. Indeed, whilst I am making a video entitled What on Earth is Going On at Marseille, following a number of requests, the answer in many respects could just be What has always happened at Marseille? Despite being one of France's most successful clubs, Marseille have been relegated four times since the late 1950s. They finished 13th in Ligue 1 as recently as the 2015-16 campaign, and they began the millennium by only avoiding relegation from Ligue 1 by virtue of goal difference. Almost three decades on from their Champions League crown though, and more than 10 years since they last won the Ligue 1 title, there are some unique elements to Marseille's current crisis that are worth exploring. So sit yourselves down, switch off from the outside world, and join me on a journey exploring the most recent crisis at one of the world's most crisis-ridden clubs. The story of Marseille's current era began in 2016 when American businessman Frank McCourt bought the club. Robert Louis Dreyfus had been OM's majority shareholder since 1996, but when he died in 2009, his second wife Margarita Louis Dreyfus inherited his shares in the club. The 2015-16 season had been a particularly disappointing one for Marseille, and Louis Dreyfus sold the club to Frank McCourt for only 45 million euros, 
at the start of the 2016-17 campaign. As a short aside to Margarita Louis-Dreyfus, I once got an email from someone claiming to be her and asking for help with a humanitarian project. I'm 99% sure that it was a scam, so I steered well clear, but maybe the Russian-born Swiss billionaire businesswoman would have become my long-term business partner had I been more accommodating and I'd be sat on a yacht in Lake Zurich right now, rather than telling the tale of her former club's most recent catastrophe. Anyhow, though Louis Dreyfus and her late husband hadn't been enormously popular among Marseille fans who had demanded change, McCourt was not hailed as the messiah. In fact, he was immediately unpopular with Owen fans, partly because he is American, and it was assumed that he knew nothing about football, and partly because of the reputation surrounding him at his former sports club, the Los Angeles Dodgers. A Boston native, McCourt had bought the Dodgers from Rupert Murdoch's Fox Entertainment Group in 2004, following a failed bid to purchase the Boston Red Sox just a couple of years earlier. Much like the Glazers' takeover of Manchester United, McCourt financed his takeover of the Dodgers primarily through debt. To offset these debts, McCourt raised ticket and concession prices at the Dodgers' stadium season upon season, which made him about as popular as you would expect with the Dodgers' fans. When McCourt's wife filed for divorce, the Dodgers became involved in a legal battle between the couple. In the end, McCourt paid his ex-wife $130 million to relinquish her claim over the team, and once he was the sole owner, the Dodgers filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. McCourt ended up selling the Dodgers for $2 billion, making it the most expensive sale of a sports team of all time, whilst he received further income from the sale of surrounding properties, whilst retaining minor ownership in nearby retail and commercial ventures. Upon his arrival at Marseille, McCourt promised fans that OM would compete with PSG for the league and title every season, a claim that few supporters took particularly seriously. McCourt went some way towards appeasing supporters by securing the return of popular former OM stars Dimitri Payet, Florian Tovan, and Rod Fanny. Payet's signing was the most significant, midway through the 2016-17 campaign, setting Marseille back a club record fee and coming off the back of a season which Payet had set the Premier League alight at West Ham United. Nevertheless, Marseille's spending still didn't come close to the money PSG were throwing around, with the Parisians investing a further €135 million Euros in their playing squad that season alone. McCourt further angered supporters by banning the Yankees, one of Marseille's many ultra-supporters group, amidst accusations that they had been selling fake tickets. Some OM fans saw this as the first signs of an attempt to remove Marseille's impassioned ultras from the Stade Velodrome creating a more sanitised experience in the ground, promoting a more middle-class support base and giving McCourt the opportunity to increase ticket prices as he had done in Los Angeles, and just as PSG's Qatari owners had done since taking over at PSG. Marseille fans are famously vocal, and will not hesitate to let players, managers and owners know exactly how they feel about them. Whilst you will often hear that clubs belong to the fans, OM fans take this rather more literally. They rarely believe that they control the club, and when they want heads to roll, they're unlikely to take no for an answer. McCourt brought in Jacques-Henri Ero as Marseille's new club president, and together they appointed Rudy Garcia as the club's new manager. Immediately, results did improve following the club's wretched 13th place finish the previous season. In a steady but unremarkable campaign, Marseille met the primary objective of qualifying for a European competition, albeit it was the Europa League rather than the Champions League following a 5th place finish. Further reinforcements were made the following season, as Steve Mandanda also returned to the club, Florian Tovan was signed on a permanent basis, and Kostas Mitroglou and Luis Gustavo strengthened Marseille's ranks in midfield and in attack, among others. The 2017-18 season showed the clearest signs of progress yet, as Marseille appeared to have some unity and a brief period of calm. The club still had to terminate Patrice Evra's contract after he kicked a fan in the head for ridiculing him during the warm-up of a Europa League game, but that's pretty tame stuff by Marseille standards. Following an excellent unbeaten pre-season, Marseille competed on multiple fronts and lost just five league games all season. Despite their resilience, they drew too many games, and in the end, they missed out on Champions League qualification by a single point. And, as you can see here, there was a huge gap between them in fourth and Ren in fifth. The team's biggest achievement came in Europe, though, where the Stad Velodrome was treated to some special European nights once again. Marseille didn't lose a single game at home throughout their entire Europa League campaign, roared on to victory against the likes of Braga, Athletic Bilbao, RB Leipzig, and Red Bull Salzburg, 
en route to the club's first Europa League final since 2004. Like in 2004, Marseille lost, but supporters were left with a sense of momentum having shifted and the feeling that they had a club that they could be proud of again. In typical Marseille fashion though, things quickly soured. The club endured an awful pre-season, Marquis signing Kevin Strootman failed to have the desired impact, and by December, Marseille had already lost more league games than they had done during the entirety of the previous campaign. As ever, supporters didn't hesitate to voice their displeasure, especially following humiliating exits from both the Coupe de France and the Europa League. Marseille didn't win a single group game in the Europa League, finishing bottom of their group and losing to Cypriot Minnow's Apoel Limassol. Meanwhile, their Coupe de France exit was even more embarrassing as the 10-time champions were dumped out by amateur fifth-tier opposition. One Marseille supporters group called The Winners unveiled an enormous banner reading, You know business, we know football. You like the sport, we love OM. You get scammed and your credibility takes a hit, you are the boss. Show us, fire the coach, shake your comics. Written entirely in English. McCourt resisted making any dismissals, but Rudy Garcia's contract wasn't extended, and he left the club at the end of the season. In his place, McCourt and Ero looked a little further afield, bringing Andre Villas-Boas back in from the cold. Villas-Boas had taken a near two-year hiatus from football, competing in the 2018 Dakar Rally, which he eventually had to withdraw from after he crashed into a sand dune and injured his back. Villas-Boas hadn't managed a team in one of Europe's Big Five leagues since his time at Tottenham Hotspur almost six years earlier, having managed Zenit St. Petersburg and Shanghai SIPG between leaving Spurs and his lengthy spell out of the game. It was a risky appointment in many respects, but the early impressions were good. Despite a pre-season defeat to Accrington Stanley and a 1-0 loss to Rems on the opening day, AVB eventually got Marseille firing again last season. Though the league season was eventually halted due to COVID-19, Marseille finished the season as the division's runners-up on a points-per-game basis. They were still some way behind PSG, but they also enjoyed a comfortable cushion over Rennes in third. What's more, from November onwards, they were showing genuine title winning, or at the very least, title contending form. When the league season was brought to an end, Marseille had lost just one of the last 17 league games, and there were only four draws during that run. In some respects, COVID couldn't have come at a worse time for Marseille, and it's difficult not to wonder what might have been were it not for the pandemic. I'm not suggesting that they would have won the league, but more the momentum that could have been brought to the club long term. Despite that disappointment though, Marseille had qualified for the Champions League for the first time in seven seasons, a big achievement for the club. Yet again, things were starting to look up. I don't suppose you can guess what happened next, can you? That's right, a chaotic pre-season and a series of high-profile bust-ups. The club failed to sign an established forward to play alongside or compete with the faltering duo of Payet and Tovan, and Villas-Boas was reportedly unhappy with the direction that the club was heading. In light of all these distractions, back-to-back -back wins against Brest and PSG at the start of the season came as something of a surprise. Indeed, Marseille's form right up to the middle of December was good, and the team still looked well-placed to at least challenge for a European place. However, behind the scenes, trouble was brewing, and it was only a matter of time before it spilt over onto the pitch. Villas-Boas had actually offered the board his resignation over the summer, only to be persuaded to stay by the Marseille players, but early on in the season, he fell out with Dimitri Payet, meanwhile Payet and Tovan had a bust-up all of their own, reportedly accusing each other of being selfish and unfit. Marseille lost to Rennes on December 16th, thus beginning one of the team's worst runs of form of the modern era, and the worst since McCourt took ownership of the club. At the time of this recording, Marseille have won just one of their last 11 games, a run which has included six defeats, and has seen Marseille slip into ninth place, miles off the pace of the top four. OM were also swiftly dumped out of the Champions League, finishing bottom of their group, meaning they didn't even drop into the Europa League. Even if you don't follow French football at all, you're probably aware that André Villas-Boas recently became the first manager to have been sacked, despite the fact that he had already resigned. This latest catastrophe came about after Marseille sold Morgan Sanson to Aston Villa, along with a couple of other players, and chose to sign Olivier and Cham on loan from Celtic with a view to a permanent. Villas-Boas made it clear in a press conference at the start of this month that he told the club he didn't want an Cham, but that they had signed him anyway and that consequently, he had once again offered his resignation, without requesting any kind of compensation. 
It was all very dramatic, and the Marseille board were reportedly left enraged by the public nature of the feud. As such, they suspended Villas-Boas and announced that they would be bringing disciplinary proceedings against him. Academy manager Nasser Lego has taken charge of the first team managerial duties on an interim basis. On the face of it, the problem may seem to lie with Villas-Boas and his displeasure at the signing of Olivia and Cham against his wishes. But in truth, Marseille's troubles run far deeper than that. Of all the characters involved in this story, Villas-Boas was probably the one who is the most popular with the Marseille fans. McCourt has been disliked since day one, though he is seen as a more detached figure who doesn't get involved in the day-to-day -day running of the club. McCourt still resides in the United States, and he was rarely spotted at Marseille games, even before COVID got its grips on Europe and the US. The vast majority of supporters and ultras' anger has been directed at Jacques Henri Ero, McCourt's early appointment as club president. Like McCourt, Ero has been unpopular with supporters since day one. Not because he's from America, but because he's from Paris, along with the fact that he had no previous experience working in football. Ero is viewed as a man in a suit who has little understanding of football culture, let alone the unique role that fans play at Marseille. Ero is an executive, best associated with Disneyland Paris, where he was a spokesperson for the theme park's opening and in its early years. And the 52-year-old Parisian is a Harvard-educated company director whose primary experiences have been in marketing, the media, and horse racing. Describing the challenges of increasing Marseille's commercial appeal, Ero once said, PSG, Monaco, and Lyon are my rivals, but Netflix are my competition. Fortnite are my competition too, because they are entertainment businesses. A statement which supporters felt represented the fact that the Parisian was out of touch. He didn't help matters a couple of months later when he said to a reporter, why not have a new rule if you score from a 30-yard shot that it counts double? Further validating theories that Aero was more interested in horse racing, which has been one of his life passions, than he was in football. Early on during his career at the club, Ero said he was concerned about the number of club staff who were from the local community and supported Marseille, suggesting that their emotional attachment to the club could impact their productivity. This enraged supporters, and Ero has been a persona non grata as far as many Marseille fans have been concerned ever since. To make matters worse, as the team with the highest average attendance in Ligue 1, Marseille are feeling the financial burden of a lack of fans during Covid more than most. Some projections expect them to have lost around 78 million euros over the past year, and 26 million euros in player sales last month, contrasted with only loan arrivals, suggests a period of austerity could be on the horizon. Just before Andre Villas-Boas left, supporters had attacked Marseille's training ground in an effort to voice their frustration during a period in which they are not allowed to attend games. Buildings were damaged, centre-back Alvaro Gonzalez was struck with a projectile whilst trying to engage with the fans, and Villas-Boas had his briefcase stolen. It's a situation which looks ugly from both the outside and the inside, and given the nature of Villas-Boas' departure, the distrust of the regime, and the vociferousness of supporters, it is going to be difficult to find a replacement for AVB. According to some reports, Maurizio Sarri and Rafa Benitez have already rejected talks, meanwhile former Barcelona boss Ernesto Valverde is said to have ruled himself out already. Ultimately, Marseille fans will not be tamed, and until either Aero or McCourt are gone, if not both, tensions seem only likely to rise. The good news for Marseille fans is that they still have a number of talented players and the arrival of Arkadu's Milik online from Napoli should finally give them the vocal point and edge up front that they ought to have recruited in the summer. The bad news is that they have an ownership and presidency whose supporters feel don't care about the club, seemingly no one of any esteem wants to manage them, they are in dreadful form, and the club's financial situation looks set only to worsen. It's a worrying situation for France's only former European champions, but as I've said a thousand times, it is nothing new. Marseille and crises go together like FIFA and corruption, like Fred and misplaced passes, like Alfie Potts Harmer and world-class football-based content. This is a club built on controversy. It is ingrained within the fabric of the club. Marseille fans have an almost unique degree of involvement in their club's affairs, but the club also has a unique element of chaos, catastrophe and scandal. For the benefit of French and European football, it suits everyone to have a competitive Marseille team and not one that crumbles like the city's historic buildings. 
So that's it for today's video, but thank you all as ever for watching. Give us a like if you enjoyed the video, let me know your thoughts down below in the comments section, and make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on for HITC settings. You can also find me on either Instagram or Twitter, or indeed both, via the username at HITC7s on both platforms, should you wish to do so.